Here's Calvin Summers. He's going to share his experiences in North Africa and overseas with Mark Clark's Fifth Army Express. So I'll turn it over to Calvin. Good morning, everybody. Glad to be here. Glad to see everyone here. Before I really get going, I kind of let you know a little bit about myself. I was born February the 14th, 1925, in Westminster, Maryland. My mother brought me to Pennsylvania, to Reading, when I was 11 months old, along with an older brother, and I was raised in Reading, went through the Reading School District, lived in a little alley in Reading called Hennishitz Court until I was 14 years old, raised during the Great Depression when everybody was poor. Of course, we didn't know it because, like I said, everybody was poor. After that, I turned 18 years old. I was inducted into the service. I got married to my childhood sweetheart six days before I went into the service. We honeymooned in my in-law's attic. <laughs> I married a wonderful woman. When we got married, they said we were too young. I was 18, she was 16. They said it would never last, we were too young. We were married for a glorious 64 years. And I was very lucky. I had one daughter, four grandchildren, 12 great-grandchildren, and 15 great-great-grandchildren, and counting. <laughs> I was inducted in the Army in July 1943 and was shipped to Camp Ellis, Illinois. Took my basic training in a laundry outfit. After my basic training, we were shipped to Newport News, Virginia, where we were attached to the 10th Cavalry, and we were shipped overseas. In the meantime, I had a daughter born that I only saw one time when she was in an incubator, I came home on furlough. But we were shipped overseas and arrived in Africa, in Tunisia, and then was bused to Algeria. So I was in North Africa for a couple months. Then we were put on another ship, and we were shipped to Italy. We landed in Naples, Italy. And it's funny, I didn't see too much action in Africa, but the first night in Italy, we were stationed in a building on the third floor, and it was right across the, the bay where we could look at the docks, and we could see the German ships coming in at night trying to bomb the docks. But where we were at, it was nice and quiet. It was like watching a movie. We could see the searchlights in the sky. We could see the German planes flying in and out with searchlights. We could see the tracers from the anti-aircraft going up, putting up an umbrella of fire. And we were just happy. We were enjoying this. Then all of a sudden, a British anti-aircraft outfit near us, sent a couple rounds of fire into the air and attracted the German planes. 
and they came over where we were at. Now, we didn't know why they did it, but they did it. When the planes came over, we got scared and we wanted to leave the building. One of the new lieutenants told us we couldn't, we shouldn't do that. That if a bomb lands on the building, it's gonna go down and explode on the first floor. Now, I don't know what kind of nuts they thought we were. But we knew if you knock the bottom out, the top's gonna fall. <laughs> so so we, went, we went right past him and ran out. So we stayed outside until the air raid was over. Of course, when we came back in, we thought we were gonna catch the devil. But the guy didn't say nothing. I guess he felt ashamed of himself. So that was our introduction into any kind of action. And uh, we, we uh, thought that we were really safe. We didn't know what it was all about. And we had been broken down in the trucking outfits or where I was a truck driver. And uh, we started uh, moving northward. And we wound up getting up near Anzio where there was a lot of action. A lot of our soldiers were pinned down. They couldn't go anywhere and they were getting killed left and right. And the Germans were using a cathedral at Monte Cassino as an observation post. At that time, the United States didn't allow us to bomb, shell, or destroy any cathedrals or any places like that. So the Germans were wise enough to use that place. And they were lobbing huge shells in on the beach, big 88 millimeter sh sh uh, shells that was fired from railroad cars. That's how big the guns were. So our outfit was just hauling supplies up, but with a lot of other help, a lot of other outfits, and with the government deciding it was all right to go ahead and shell the cathedral, we got the Germans out of there, and the soldiers were able to get off of the Anzio beachhead. So I just kept driving my truck as usual, all the way up through Italy, up through Rome, up into northern Italy. And uh, in the meantime, during one of our convoys, I had a little incident. We had five trucks in the convoy with two men in each truck, a driver and assistant driver. And uh, we ran into an ambush, which happened now and then. But this particular ambush was all set up. We had a side road there. We turned off into the side road to get away from the ambush. The Germans had that road mined. We didn't know that, but we thought we were getting away. We pulled into that, into that road, and I, along with others, got blown out of my truck. But uh, I woke up the next day in the hospital, and they told me what happened. I was very fortunate. My truck had a canvas top on it. I was blown out through that and I landed in a huge mud puddle. And that saved my life. I just wound up with a few scrapes and bruises, but out of the 10 men in the convoy, only two of us survived. I don't know what happened to the other soldier because the next day they said I was well enough to go back, so they sent me back to my outfit and into another truck. So life goes on. The next thing I knew, I ran into a lot of civilians there in Italy. And it was strange. They used to ask us to see our tails. We couldn't understand it. We found out later on that they had been told that the black soldiers were part monkey. 
And we had tails that came out at night. We couldn't understand at first why they told them that, but we found out they told them that to keep us from fraternizing with the civilians. Of course, it didn't help. But I found out later on that there's a whole lot of mixed babies over there. <laughs> but it was, it was one of those things. And another thing I can remember, I saw a lot of poor, starving civilians. People that had a hard time getting food. Because if we went to our mess halls to eat, the people would come and raid cans where we put our garbage. Because they were trying to find food. So what we would do, we felt sorry for them. We would go back and get seconds, and bring it around and put it in the cans. So they would have more food to get. Naturally, being Americans, that's the way we were. <laughs> that's the way we were raised. So that was another incident. So I went all the way up through northern Italy, into northern Italy, rather, above Pisa, into Florence, Italy. And I was there when the war ended in Europe. Oh, I started feeling good then. I said, oh boy. I'll be going home now, because that was after 18 months in Italy. But that's not the end of the story. <laughs> Our outfit was sent to a little place called Marina de Pisa along the coast, put aboard ships again, and was sent out through the Mediterranean Sea, back across the Atlantic, he said, oh boy, we're going home. We'll probably get a furlough before we worry about fighting the Japanese. That wasn't to be. We got 200 miles off the coast of Virginia. They announced over the PA system that we were 200 miles off the coast of Virginia. And they turned south. They took us down along the coast, all the way down around and through the Panama Canal out across the Pacific to the Philippine Islands. So we didn't get home. So they tried to land us in the northern part of Luzon, but it was, their fighting was too fierce. They couldn't land us there. They took us down below Manila, a little place called Batangas, and that's where they landed us and stationed us. I was in the Philippines for a few months, it wasn't long after that that uh, they dropped the A-bomb on Japan and the Japanese surrendered. They put us on another ship and sent us into Japan. I said, well, I don't know what's next, <laughs> you know. And uh, I was in Japan for a while and I got a chance to see the two towns where they dropped the bombs, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And uh, it was just another experience. Then they decided that uh, I had enough points to be discharged, because they were discharging them by points at that time. And they decided to send me home. Now when I came home, they flew me, they, I came to the United States by ship. Then I was flown from San Francisco to DC, then bused to Fort Meade, Maryland, where I was to be discharged. And uh, it was just, I was just glad to be home. So what I did, I called my wife, tell my wife I was back in the States, and we told her where I was at to be discharged. And she was glad I was home. <laughs> and uh, I got, the feeling I wanted to see a relative. I had a relative that was living in Baltimore, an aunt. So I asked for a pass to go into town to visit my aunt. They said, okay, sure, you can have a pass today. You're not going to be discharged for a couple days yet. So I got the pass, walked down to get on a bus, met another soldier who was there. He was from Philadelphia. And we were talking while we were waiting on the bus 
and uh, tell him, I was telling him my experiences and about my family. He would tell me, he was telling me about his. He was going to be going home to his mother and father. He wasn't married. And uh, the bus came. We got on the bus, and as I was walking down the aisle in the middle of the bus, somebody said, hello, soldier. And I looked down, and there was my wife. <laughs> it, it was wonderful. I hadn't seen her for two and a half years. She had came down to my aunt's to visit my aunt. She came out to the camp to see me, and they told her that I had gotten a pass and was going in town to my aunt's. And she happened to get on that same bus. That was just a miracle. <laughs> so I, I stayed, she stayed there overnight, and I went back to camp. The next day, I was lucky I got discharged. And I came home with my wife to see my daughter after all that time. And it was a wonderful, happy reunion. Now the only problem I had then was getting work to take care of my family. But it was kind of hard to get a decent job at that time. And mostly, to tell you the truth, it was because of color. It was hard for a black person to get a good, decent job in Reading at that time. So what happened, I moved to Philadelphia. I got lucky, got hold of a good job working for the city of Philadelphia in the water department. They paid for some training from Penn State for me. And I became a water treatment plant operator. I paid good money, easy work. That was for me. <laughs> so I did that for 25 years. And it was just wonderful. My wife got a job down there working for the Social Security Administration. And she worked there for 25 years. So we did pretty well. And we retired and came back to Reading. Now, the funny thing, when I was discharged, we received ribbons. And I was told that in order to get the medals to go with the ribbons, I had to contact the office in Missouri, which I tried to do to get my medals. I tried for 50 years to get my medals. They kept telling me that there had been a fire out there, the records had been burned, and kept putting me off like that. So finally, I went to my congressman, Tim Holden, to have him intercede for me. He did. And in four weeks' time, I got my medals. Now, my medals included the Good Conduct Medal, Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal, European African Middle Eastern Campaign Medal with a Bronze Star, World War II Victory Medal, Philippine Liberation Ribbon, Honorable Service Lapel Button, World War II, Marksman Badge with Rifle Bar, Driver and Mechanics Badge. And Thank you. And that is about the end of my story, except the fact I'm glad to be here. And if I have any, anybody have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Yes, that had happened too. Because a lot of heroism that we had done, 
was not reported at all. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'll tell you. Now, you have to repeat that again so I'll make sure I don't mess it up. Yes, well, we had heard that too. It's the same way there was a lot. I know a lot of you people now have heard about the Tuskegee Airmen. But I probably saw the movie The Red Tails. That, well, I was over the scene at the same time they were there. And a lot of things were never reported. I was surprised, and I didn't know who had put me in for the Bronze Star. One of my officers must have put me in for it. I don't know which one. But I, I didn't dispute it. <laughs> I was glad they get it, <laughs> but uh, I, it was it was just an experience for a young man from 18 to 21. It was a good way to see parts of the world, but I never went back to see it again. <laughs> um, how were you received by the Japanese? Well, I'll I'll tell you. It was a funny thing. I didn't interact with any of them because I think I was afraid of them and they were afraid of me. So when I was there, everything was like new. We didn't really get together that much. So I saw them and they saw me and we just did our own little thing. But I had no problems there. Mm -hmm. um, more sensitive question. Yeah. The guys in your unit Oh, you know, that, that, is, that is a thing that we ran into. Because we thought that after fighting, we come back home, things would be different here. But we found out there was no changes. It was very disappointing. And that uh, made our coming back and getting back into civil life, civilian life, it made it very hard. Because like I said, it was very disappointing. But uh, we said, oh, well, we're uh, back to zero. So, no, we had no problems overseas. Of course, we did. I had one, one place that I did run, in, run into a problem was that uh, when I was in Italy, where they had the uh, officers' clubs and the soldiers' clubs, uh, they were, everything was segregated. The whites had their clubs, us blacks, we didn't even have a club. But what made us feel bad was that we weren't allowed in their clubs, but captive Italian soldiers were allowed in there. Yeah, but that's the way it was. So we learned to cope with it. The same as when we come back home, we learned to cope with everything else. And it was a lot easier because we looked and we seen that our parents and our brothers and sisters and our cousins, they were still making it, they were still living. So we said, okay, we're right back in the saddle again. But things are a lot different now. There's been a lot of changes. It's not perfect, but we're getting there. Things are getting better. Oh yeah, well we're gonna make it. Well, we're getting there, we're gonna make it. It's no problem. I just hope they make it in my time. <laughs> yes, we were, we were trained with uh, rifles. And uh, being a truck driver, we had 30 caliber carbines, smaller rifles. We didn't have the big M1s. We had the smaller rifles that were easier to carry and easier to handle. Did you get a chance to use it? Yeah, we had, because we got ambushed often. So we had some, say, some places we had to fight our way out. So it was all part of it. Now don't ask me if I shot anybody. I ain't telling that. Oh, that's a 
<laughs> right. But this, I'm just glad to be here and glad to see everybody here. And I'd rather you see me than view me. Right. <laughs> Thank you.